Yeah, yeah. yeah I, only, I only kind of thought he had it in Europe. Um, all right, anyway, so we should start the talks. Um, we'll start with me. Uh, so I'd like to thank the organizers, of course, but you know, I'm an organizer myself. So while I'm talking, I'd like to thank the conveners for asking me to give two different talks this week and after some um, discussion, it was downgraded to a talk and then a discussion on Friday afternoon. So at least I'm going to give one talk. And why this talk? Um, well, one reason is um, my collaborators, Dan Petoniak and Matt Sievert, are not here. Um, and he couldn't come to this program at all. Dan came in week two, but we we'll talked about his work on TMTs. Um, uh, now, this talk is about uh, spin, one congruent helicity mainly, but also about transversity of small x. And uh, uh, I gave this operating with three of the programs for a mainly spin uh, audience. Um, and um, um, and uh, um, of course, uh, the results of this work are important for spin community, but um, giving it in this week and with six to small x experts, I think the point is that the techniques here are small x techniques which we know and love, and a lot of people in this room have contributed to this field, and there's a lot of questions here to be addressed. So my talk is by no means um, you know, the last word in this direction. So my goal is really to get people more excited about doing this type of questions in small x. Groups. All right, so outline of the talk is kind of uh, Mundane, so I'll describe briefly the goal. I can go in a little more detail uh, if need be, uh, but uh, really um, the goal is to understand small x asymptotics of various <coughs> transverse momentum dependent distributions. This, this code is dying on me almost. Um, so uh, this has to be lowercase. So I just un understand small x asymptotics of TMDs, um, and I'll specifically talk most of the time about helicity. That's what the conveners wanted me to talk about. Um, and if I have the time, I'll also, also mention uh, transversity. Just for the battery problems. Oh, okay. I think I'm uh, sure, yeah, yeah, the have batteries. Sure, I think they need why I put them on chain. Hmm? They need why I put them on chain. Oh, yes, yeah, just give me the remote. Uh, we'll go and take the battery. Just the battery. Just like the battery. OK, um, anyway, so the, the outline of the talk will be rather uh, Repetitive, I guess, uh, is the word. We'll start with discussing quark helicity, and we'll start by taking the operator definition of quark helicity and massaging it to a fairly uh, simplified form in small x. Then we we'll write down small x evolution equations for the results of simplified operator, and um, then we we'll solve these equations to find the small x asymptotics of quark helicity. And then repeat for gluon helicity. Start with an operator, massage it, write small x evolution equations for it, and solve the equations to find the small x asymptotics. And finally, um, as I said, if I have the time, I'll repeat it with a balance quark transversity, repeat all the steps. So by this point, the uh, technique is getting kind of to the point of almost a factory of the limits, right? So there is a well-defined procedure. But of course, there are important questions to be addressed. Uh, beyond maybe this procedure. So, as a way of sort of summary, in the beginning of the talk, the main physical results. So, if you're not interested in technical details, uh, main physical results. Oh, the batteries are here. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, this, uh, okay. um, uh, are here. So, the quark helicity distribution delta Q in, in a large and C limit, where we can solve the equations. Uh, goes as 1 over x to some power, and that power is given by this expression here. Uh, so for small x experts in the room, I think you're probably more used to, oh, there it goes. But, uh, I'm more used to power of alpha s, not the square root of alpha s, uh, but this is what happens in the case of helicity evolution. We have this double log approximation. So 1 power of alpha s comes with 2 powers of log 1 over x. I'll describe it in more detail later, such that the asymptotics, the lowest order in alpha s is actually, uh, the intercept is proportional to a square root of alpha s. 
our gluon, uh, our conclusion for the gluon distribution delta G is this power here, slightly different, slightly smaller numerically than the power for delta Q. And for transversity, these uh, transversity T and Ds, um, um, uh, we get one over X to some power, to another different power, which is given here. So it's even uh, minus one. Oh, L is there. Uh -huh. So uh, at minus one plus some correction. Would you like to give your talk? <laughs> Be right back. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, any questions? <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Huh? Can you remind us again what the spin decomposition is? Very good. Uh, oh, no. I don't have a pi. Chart. So um, to remind you the spin decomposition, so uh, it depends who you listen to. Uh, I, we usually work in uh, Jack and Manatar um, decomposition. So the statement is that one half delta sigma plus delta G plus LQ, so orbital angular momentum of quarks plus orbital momentum, angular momentum of gluons should be one half. That's what you're asking about? Do you know how much is each? Oh, how much is each? Ah, <laughs> so it's complicated questions. Okay, so this is uh, about a point, I don't know, 17, let's say. Uh, delta G has larger error bars. Um, uh, it's measured at rig recently by a star experiment, but I believe it's 0.3 plus minus. Don't go to the I'm on the point record, point so I'm not going to say. It's much more. 0.2. Oh, yeah. Right here. Right here. Right. 0.2 now? It's come down? Plus minus 0.06. 0.06. Okay, I was going to say 0.1 to be more yeah. so it's in the Okay, so I wasn't just no. Okay, so if you add those up, you kind of get closer to one half, but it's still not quite there. But then there are places to look, and one of the places is smaller. And that's what I was going to show. That contributes to. Okay, so, so when, when you delta define those delta points, delta. Like this, say if you define delta sigma, it's an integral, strictly mm -hmm. speaking. So delta sigma of q squared is an integral from 0 to 1 dx. Del u over x q squared plus del u bar over x and q squared plus del d plus del d bar plus del s plus del s bar, which is people don't go to pay with flavors. Um, so, point is you need to integrate down to zero, but that requires measuring down to x equals zero. No one ever measures down to x equals to zero, right? So, in practice, there is x mean. Which is the expectation? Oh, yes, there it is. But so what you're doing would contribute to both, right? Not just to that. Okay, so my talk is about delta sigma and delta g. Actually, Yoshikata and myself, we're currently working on small exosynthesis of LQ and LG. You can define um, differential distribution, say DLQ, DS. In DLG DX. And a small x, so far we've been able to relate this to delta sigma with, delta, with DLG DX where it started. But today I'm talking about things which are done, not about things which are kind of in flux. And I cannot say anything solid about that. Any other questions? All right, so uh, by the way, and notice that this results of large and C, and indications are there's another limit which is a large and C and F limit where equations close and could be solved, but the behavior would be um, might be modified. So this is not the last word in this direction. Okay, uh, so motivation is kind of outlined here. Uh, we want the uh, uh, spin sum rule to work. Um, so all these things should add up to one half. 
uh, all those contributions. And here is an example specifically of delta sigma integrated from some x mean that is accessible experimentally up to one, uh, plotted as a function of x mean. And you can see that the plotter values of x mean, everything is under control. What's plotted here <coughs> is a DSSV parameterizations in 08 and 2014. Uh, so at larger x mean, everything is under control. Once x mean gets smaller, all the uncertainties get quite broad, right? And ultimately, we need to send x mean to zero. So we need to sort of go down to minus infinity on this axis and show uh, and see where the integral, uh, what number it approaches, right? That would be the ultimate value of delta sigma integrated from zero, not from x mean to one, which is what enters the speed sum. So at small x, you have negative contribution. Uh, yeah, there's no, no, no one, this, these quantities are not positive definite. They can be negative. And actually, with my, my previous comment about, for instance, uh, including the large NF, so not just taking large NC limits, but taking large NC and NF limit, very, very preliminary indication that you, you get this function multiplied by some oscillatory function of the cosine um, of log one over x. Or so, so none of this is a positive definite. Um, there's also indications, say, from Yoshi's work with, with the lot of OAMs, is that these contributions usually are negatives of delta sigma and delta g. So, um, and, and lattice, uh, so lattice data also seems to indicate that OAM um, tends, uh, so orbital angular momentum tends to be opposite to the uh, spin of the protein, so it tends to be negative. So it's not, right, so this is not the sum of necessarily positive. Brian, you have a question, a uh, concern in your eyes. Am I saying something wrong? No. no. Okay. <laughs> you have to squint sometimes. Oh, okay. Oh, that's very intimidating. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, okay, so that was delta sigma. With delta g, you can see the story is even uh, worse. The, 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 the arrow bars get broader sooner as we go to the smaller values of x. And of course, um, this. These plots are a motivation, say, for EIC construction. Uh, one of the motivations for EIC to be able to narrow down all these error bands and actually try to nail down the uh, speed sum rule. Okay, uh, so we want to understand these small x contributions before EIC, or at least in preparation for EIC. We want to develop some theory for the small x contributions, um, and we want to essentially do the same thing as we do it uh, in unpolarized small x, right? We have evolution, small x evolution equations, we take dipole amplitude, evolve it, and, and fit a lot of small x error data, interactive data, structure function data, and it all works very well. So why can't we do it for spin x as well? And then once we do it, we'll have some sort of a, a way of um, either guide people doing PTFs or doing, doing just our own small x evolution fit for the small x tails of all those uh, uh, quantities, delta sigma and delta g. So really what is the question is, okay, this is sort of, um, you know, a result of DSSE parameterizations. Maybe this particular line is partially constrained by the data, partially biased by the choice of the um, initial conditions. Uh, but really what is the small x prediction? And uh, you know, at some, at some level this is quite open until you do the calculation. And this is what we want. Oops. Uh, the transversity, again, I keep saying that if I have the time to get to it, so I'm not sure I will. Uh, um, but transversity is a quantity um, similar to helicity. So by the way, for students in the, in the room, helicity, you just look at the number of spin up quarks minus spin down quarks, right? Uh, and up and down is uh, defined by the direction of the proton spin. Transversity is you look at the number of spin up quarks minus spin down quarks, where up and down is, there, is some direction perpendicular to the proton spin. So transversity um, is, is something like you have a proton with a spin pointing this way, and you're looking for spin up quarks minus a proton spin pointing this way, and you have spin down quarks. Does it matter here what, what's the direction the proton is going? So you you, you mean in terms of rotation of transfers? I mean with the B. So somehow if we're thinking of experiment, is this transverse field we want to polarize proton? 
it's a, it's a legit, it, uh, oh, I'm sorry, what am I writing? Oh, I wrote the full nonsense, sorry. Um, no, 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 it's the same thing. It's a transversely polarized problem, and you, you subtract, subtract spin up and spin down. Sorry. I was too concerned about what I was uh, doing uh, Okay, um, so so whereas whereas these things helicities are of course um, you have an extremely polarized proton and you can, and, and oh yeah and, and the beam is this way and, and here as well. Um, and, and you subtract the spin down. Okay. Um, and you would say that they should be related, like kind of related, but uh, you cannot derive one from the other. So, transversity and felicity. Um, and uh, uh, so, this is, for instance, uh, one statement there is, uh, so there is this transversity. Uh, distribution, if you integrate it over all x, you get something called tensor charge. And apparently, in various models of you know, the unstandard model of physics, uh, there are quantities which uh, may contribute to this tensor charge, um, non trivial amounts. Don't, ask, don't quiz me on that, but some people are, are in the SM physics are interested in, in this quantity for the in this tensor charge of the proton. And um, um, so, in that sense, knowing tensor charge is important to them. And you have sort of a similar issue here. We don't know. So this is this transversity plot as a function of x. We don't know. The, uh, so this is one of the recent extractions, not the most recent, which was presented a few weeks ago here. Um, but uh, we have no theoretical guidance on small x behavior of H1 um, um, uh, to, to get uh, to, to integrate over all x and get. Um, and there is a bound, so-called software bound, which binds it. Uh, uh, so this is this on the, uh, uh, upper and lower curve. Uh, you can see that the bound is not really in any danger of being violated with small x, but nonetheless, we need to know how much transversity there is in small x to find out what the standard charge is. Okay? And if you want more detail, Mark already should give a talk in week two in this program. The talk is online. You can watch it. Uh, we talk about this. Okay, so uh, this is just sort of introduction. Um, um, now the question is, um, uh, how do we calculate those quantities? So let's start with uh, quark helicity, so something like delta sigma. Um, and I'm gonna consider the flavor single case, which is, which is shown here, right? Del u plus del u bar, del v plus del v bar, del s plus del s bar. Uh, so this is sort of a table of all the TMDs, just to, show you where we are, we're talking about helicity, so that means we have a, um, yeah, so this is kind of what I drew here, by the way. So helicity is spin up uh, quark in a spin up, uh, in a proton with a original spin, minus spin down quark, for instance, so this is a quark helicity. Um, transversity is this thing, as I, as I showed here. Uh, but right now, let's concentrate on helicity for quarks. And you can have all the other distributions. Um, so we we'll start with uh, um, uh, operator definition. So you uh, uh, take this uh, transfer. Uh, sorry, helicity TMD. You have, uh, of course, you have psi bar and psi operator. Uh, you insert this gamma plus gamma five to project out helicity. Um, uh, to make the object gauge invariant, you insert the Wilson uh, uh, link, Wilson staple. Uh, I'll, I'll elaborate on this. In a Few minutes, they take the expectation value of this in this machine polarized proton state, and you fully transform into transverse momentum space and also in a K plus momentum space where K plus is X times P plus. And, and you sum over all spins if you want, or you can just take a, a proton spin to be a projection to be plus one. <clears throat> so um, we are going to be working in uh, uh, the light cone gauge of the projectile, so we have a plus moving proton, and we will be working in a minus equal zero light cone gauge where this uh, Wilson line staple can be written as just two Wilson lines going off to infinity uh, and back in the minus direction. So these Vs are fundamental Wilson lines, 
um, and the two arguments at the beginning and ending points along the light point, the subscript is the transverse position. This is one of our standard conventions, the small x physics, but unlike our small x Wilson lines, these are not infinite, these are semi -infinite. Okay, so this is, um, uh, this is the uh, object that we wanna work with. Um, so, um, and, and actually, so I, I, uh, there are some steps in this transition, so it's not quite trivial. Right here we have one integration, a small x, we have a shock wave, so we, we assign, uh, instead of having zero in, in an argument of psi bar, we have to put some position psi here and some position say for there and integrate over both of them. And this angle break is now denote the typical CGC averaging inside the shock wave. So there is a transition here, which I don't want to bore you with all these points, but it is there. Um, and then we have to, uh, we want to um, uh, further simplify this object. So what is this? So this is not a time ordered product, right? This is just a product of operators. So you insert a complete set, set of states somewhere in the middle and you can write it as an amplitude squared. Um, and, and these are various diagrams contributing uh, as long as you concentrate on this Wilson line, V. So for instance, uh, we may have the, um, so, so vertical bar, so let's concentrate just on one case. Vertical bar is a shock wave to the left of the cut and to the right of the cut. And then the, uh, the zeta and psi are positions of the uh, starting points of the Wilson lines, V and if you wish, V dagger. Um, so those are, these are the Wilson lines. One starts at zeta, one starts at psi. They both go to plus infinity. They are at different transverse positions. This is not shown here, but you know, perfection is hard to achieve. But uh, uh, nonetheless, uh, the, those Wilson lines go off to plus infinity. And you have to consider all the possible cases. In this expression, we integrate over all psi minus and zeta minus, right? So the light compositions in the x minus direction uh, uh, so the shock wave, the proton is moving in the plus direction and the uh, Wilson line goes in the minus direction. Uh, so the starting point could be inside the shock wave or it could be outside the shock wave. It could be to the left of the shock wave or to the right of the shock wave. So you get all these many different combinations. The zeta and psi inside the shock wave, one is before, one is after, uh, both are before, both are after, one is in the shock wave, another one is out, and before and after. And to each diagram, you have to imagine adding a complex conjugate diagram. There's some kind of, uh, you know, even more diagrams to have used. So the shock wave is the gluon field of the proton, it means the parts of the gluon. Gluon and quark field of the proton. The shock wave. Yes. It's not just gluons anymore, because we're talking about helicity. So this is, uh, the story is subiconal now. At subiconal level, quarks contribute just as much as the gluons. But yeah, as, as a good starting point, you can see gluons. And ultimately, when we take a large C limit, that's what is going to be left. But actually, so unlike Jimbock and BK case where you take the large C limit, and that's the only case when the equation is closed, here you can take also the large C and an F limit, where equations would, get, would also close, they would be different, but you would have quarks left. So the leading order quarks, so unlike BFL, let's say, the leading order here quarks can be. Okay, that's why Lachian C and an F limit is different from Lachian C. <coughs> do, do we have the same, I mean, the factorization of the TMD is a lot more complicated than regular TMD exercises and soft factors. Yeah. Do all of those things follow suit here? No, so I don't, I'm not putting any soft factors. I just take this definition, and uh, uh, for me, the slope of the Wilson line uh, is related to. Uh, essentially low one variance. So it's, uh, you can think of it as a CDS scattering. If you talk to, you know, John Collins and Jeff Rogers, they say, oh, divided by the soft factors and all that. Yes. But I think they start with the slope being kind of completely arbitrary. And when you put it on a light one, they have a heat divergence, yes. which is a problem yeah. for them. Yes. Well, we, we, for us, it's, it's, a, it's just a bug, them. it's a feature. Huh? It's just for them. So that is a standard problem. Uh, yeah, we'll not follow X physics, right? Not follow X. Okay, so what saves you in the right? Because we have a finite slope, which is given by um, some sort of mass. Right, and, and then we evolve it. Really. This is what, so in other words, when I'm talking about determining X dependence, I'm going to say that my Wilson lines 
um, have uh, so think of it as cities, right? The photon comes in, interacts here with the shock wave, generates this quark. So the Wilson line comes out of quark. Quark, of course, uh, is not exactly on the Wilson line. Right. We have a finite center of mass energy of the process. So the, there is a, 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 a you don't have an infinity. You have a rapidity divergence, but it's cut off by the center of mass energy of the process. Or in other words, by, by the order mass. So for us, that's all the game. We want to resum those things and we want to do it to less uh, um, um, to X dependence of the quantity. So if you want to see the inverse of that, T and D usually, the X is not small, right? So you have a, uh, I mean, usually you're looking for something almost collinear, but with a very, very small chunk. Well, we have a large Q squared, and yes, so, large Q squared. so my our Q squared is not terribly large, so that X is small. So Q squared over S is small. So what is the large thing? I mean, eventually you're going to go to larger K for Q squared at some point. So Q squared is still large, so okay. I think it's, uh, it's um, trying at least to dream. Uh, this so Q squared is still large, but it's, it's not necessarily a, uh, it's not necessarily a much larger than Q squared. So K D not of the order of lambda C D or something? No, it's ultimately gonna be an order of QS. Okay, so so it's still much larger than lambda to C D. So. You're starting from something of the order of lambda QC, right? Then you're going to evolve. You're not just going to evolve. One evolves in X. X. Yeah. And and well, it depends on your initial conditions. You may not start with yes, something no. like a D model with some of the experiments, which will be just for the order of lambda QC. Yeah, but you're not touching. That's the point. Using T with factor addition, I think you're really evolving Q squared, right? It's kind of right. Like, yeah. Here you don't touch it, so you're just taking x evolutions. I mean, the x evolution is what requires this rapidity divergence. It generates so much. All right, so right. the starting point. So I'm not sure exactly how to map these TMDs and the, the ones people use in TMD visualization. But for us, it's important to say. But you're uh, calling it TMD, that's fine. Well, it's a TMD in the sense that ultimately, if I integrate this over all KT, right? So ultimately, I'm interested in say. But uh, this quantity, if I integrate it over all KT, will give me a TMD. Right? So, sure, uh, but the, the TMD part is really just one perturbative distribution, right? You have to perturb it this small. With the K part became very large, you could perturb it. That, that, that's it. the standard fault law. Okay, so time, there's nothing wrong with saying that uh, you know, small x KT could be of the order of QS squared. Then it's perturbative. Then it's perturbative. It's perturbative to calculate the radiative new one. And why is it just uh, uh, not perturbative? You need it to be on the order of Q squared. Yeah. Initial yeah. one being on the order. No, but that's my question. So initial condition is on the order of lambda Q squared. Then you're going to go up and up. Right? Initial no, conditions are not in Q squared. Initial conditions are not in Q squared. The data K is very old. Right? Like, yes, the data is very old. The data is very old. Initial conditions are given to evolutionism X. Initial conditions would be given at some X naught. And they may already be perturbed. You may already have some saturation scale in your initial yeah, condition. Then the K-perp is generated by a perturbatively radiative. Yes. So and it's not a TMD. Then and it's not a TMD. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. 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 Right, so if, so if you if I be more assertive on yeah, this yes. side, then uh, you have a large Q squared to have factorization. But you know, so you have ones are just not non perturbative. Non perturbative. Why do they have to be non perturbative? Because people usually say actual measurements who are KTs are so small, they're over their lambda to CD, larger X measurements. And they say, well, it's non perturbative. Because the operator is an operator, right? It doesn't tell you perturbative. So I'm saying that if it was perturbative, you wouldn't need an, an object to just calculate. I could 
just take it. And that would be a synergy. Remind KT of the other. Sort of what I'm doing. I'm going to be involved with the next. I'm going to calculate it. Okay, fine. I'm not going to do that. Okay. But I mean, I think overall it's a good point. I don't, I mean, this is sort of what we have in mind, how it matches with those TMDs where you divide out soft factors. Oh, it's under the organization for now. Then you know, arise in Quito, you know. So they have, instead of double log rapidity, they have log of blue square times log of their cutoff rapidity. Right. Yeah, because of their cutoff. And now cutoff is just log square of our cutoff. But they don't divide that, their, their activity dependence out by dividing this. It's a this technical, technical trick. What we really need is a good student who can make a decision. It doesn't matter. I mean, if you have, say, two loops, then change yeah, of your scale is one loop calculation. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm working on that. Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. Then. Uh, well, I know what we're doing. So you're saying it's equivalent. Like well, so you divide out by root s or not, or the end result. Yeah, I think you can take the two loop result, make some one loop calculation, and not end up in our two loop with our two loop result. I think it's good. Oh, okay. All right, so let's leave it at that since I'm going to run out of time. But the space. Anyway, so these are all the diagrams you have to consider. Uh, these are sort of, you know, uh, people may ask, what are those, you know, dots hanging in there? Well, what the, what we really mean, for instance, here is you have a Wilson line, and then you have some anti-quark line coming back here. Uh, so this are more more like flesh and bone examples of what we mean by those diagrams. So when zeta and psi are inside the shockwave, they interact like this. So actually, Edmund, this shows that the shockwave has to carry quark fields to, for this diagram to exist. Um, you can have uh, things like this, more like a traditional small X process where you have an antiquark going through the shockwave. And the box here denotes that we need a sub icon of interaction which uh, couples the spin of this antiquark with the spin of the shockwave. So it's a non iconal interaction and it's denoted by a box here. Here's an example of, uh, of uh, C type diagrams, et cetera. D is really obviously uh, not a relevant diagram because it cannot transfer any spin information because really nothing interacts with the shockwave. So we cannot transfer the spin information on the shockwave to this. Uh, um, two point function. Uh, and you have other diagrams, ENF also represented. So, uh, in the end of the day, to make the long story short, let me just claim that only diagram D contributes. Diagram D is obviously out. Diagram C actually cancels because you can slide this interaction, or say this T channel quark, you can slide it to the right of the cut, uh, uh, and this T channel quark, you can slide it to the left of the cut, and you get two virtual diagrams which cancel this diagram C. So they actually uh, don't contribute. Um, you can show that diagram F is sort of energy suppressed. You have this uh, gluon which has to live inside the shockwave, which is a very short time. Um, and, and moreover, this uh, you know, Wilson line gluon interaction can be shown to be non iconal uh, Diagram E uh, and diagram E are kind of left and require further analysis, but the claim is they cancel each other at this double log uh, and the double log order, which, I, which we're going to be working in, which I'll elaborate in later. So if you're interested in log squared 1 over x times alpha s corrections, diagrams A and E cancel, and you left on with the diagram B. Um, that, uh, so this is also, this could also be obtained if we define a TMD is not through the operators by, by doing uh, CDS, uh, so uh, semi-inclusive diplomatic scattering process. In other words, we have a diplomatic scattering process where we're producing a quark. And the tag on that quark. So we, we're looking at differential quark production cross section with a given transistor network. Uh, and if we're interested in a continual spin dependent part of the process, we can draw diagrams. Uh, now, this is sort of a small x uh, uh, parlance. You can draw diagrams with the splitting happening before or, uh, the shock wave or after, um, after the shock wave, uh, and you may have this non icon spin dependent interaction. Uh, like this. I I'm sorry, somehow that uh, it's not probably very visible, but really we have two T channel quark exchanges here, or both of them on one side of the cut or complex conjugate one. Those things cancel. This is kind of like diagram uh, C in this language. And what's left is the asymmetric contributions where one splitting is before the shock wave to the left of the cut, say, and another one is after, and the complex conjugate one. So, sorry, uh, so you say. This is if you don't want to have operators, uh, right when you started showing this right? Yeah. 
Okay, so my question is a bit messy, but it, it seems like, I mean, these first two diagrams you drew, these are different operators in, in the dog itself. They're different operators here. I mean, one of them is kind of, uh, I mean, what operators would you put for each diagram? Just read them like this one. Uh, so the diagrams are to calculate the cross section. Yeah, right. So the, the operators were done here. I'm just saying that it's equivalent to uh, calculating uh, the cross section of a core production. And I'm looking at the helicity dependent part of, of this. So something proportional, so I need the term proportional to the helicity of the core times helicity of the product. Sorry for the abundance of signals in the direction. Um, right, so I'm just asking a question. If I'm producing a core and uh, the proton is Ah, okay. And the proton is initially polarized, um, and I want something where um, I need something dependent on this. Uh, I need the part of the cross section which knows about the. Uh, um, Polarization of this proton, so it couples polarization of the quark to the polarization of the proton. What's the question? Sorry, the question is, I'm I'm not just, this the second diagram is very weird to me, but I'm probably second not used diagram. enough to include it here. In corneal polarization, I would never write such a oh, So this is a standard smaller slight quantification theory. Yeah. Yeah, so in a, in a standard final diagram, well, uh, so you, this shock wave is still in the shock wave is still here, here but, 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 but right. So this are just Wilson lines. Mm -hmm. This is icon, and this is sub -icon. Okay. At this point, you don't have to write down the operator. So okay. operators will be written. Oh, don't worry. There will be operators. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's just a quark propagator in the right. So right. So you can write. So for this, you, right. So so ultimately, right. what you need, and that, that I'll get to it later. Um, uh, you need the anti core propagators with the shock wave interacting in a sub icon uh, way. So, usually we just write a Wilson line for the icon, uh, high, high energy limit. But then, this is a, uh, but then, then you wouldn't get any dependence on the speed. Yeah, but I mean, this second diagram uh, looks like a propagator correction in sub icon. The, the left one is a vertex correction. No, no, it's just a propagator right. which assumes that in the external field there are also ports and not just one. So right. So, I mean, if you're happier, I can redraw the diagram on the right. Um, if it would make you happier, I don't know if it would. Um, um, in the following way. So, so suppose I have, this is my shock wave interaction um, on the left. And the blob denotes that this gluon vertex is not icon. This is not just gamma plus or gamma minus, depending on your light cone direction. It could be a gamma type of thing, okay? So it's non iconal and, and then you have a cut, you type on the quark, and then you have another shock wave here with all other, you know, gluon interactions, which you include by those in mind. Yeah. So I'm not sure what's your worry. Okay, let's discuss that. It's the same diagram. Yeah, it's the same diagram. Oh, well, no, the same <laughs> It's like quarks, it's like gluons. I thought um, well, it's we know that we have to with gluons, but that didn't work. Exactly. No, it's just that one is a cut diagram, the other one is cut. So I would expect to accept What do you mean? They're all cut? And you're summing them to zero. Which is what you said. Oh, oh, you're saying this one is cut, this is not, right? Yeah. So exactly. they still cancel. So they cancel each other, not separate. So okay, so so um, the, the, this plus this. So this, this exchange has a real imaginary parts. Yeah. Um, real, oh, part, real, real parts, real parts cancel between yeah. this and okay. C C, and the imaginary okay. part okay. cancels between this and both of those. Right. So and it right. works. The unitarity works. It doesn't have to be completely imaginary. Yeah, no, okay, so real parts there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it works. I'm sorry. Uh, anyway, that was just a uh, side remark. So now we're kind of done with the introductory part, as in we have things. <laughs> the, the, the square TMD is a function of something I will write in a few minutes, but this is a sort of polarized dipole amplitude. So this is an analog of N in an unpolarized evolution. Why do we call it G? I don't remember. But so this is a dipole amplitude, depends on two transverse positions, and on logit uh, Z is a function of longitudinal momentum carried by, say, the, uh, what's this? Ah. Carried by the, say, the scientific work line here. 
Um, so then we have some integrals over transverse momenta and over the steel momentum fraction, which needs to be done, and that gives us the work T. Okay. Um, okay, anyway, so uh, uh, these are all details we don't have the time for. What is this operator G, right? Really, this is all that where the physics is. So G is this object right here. So it's a dipole amplitude where I have, say, a quark line and an anti quark line. The quark line uh, plus the, the term where we have an anti quark and a quark at the same positions. Uh, the quark line uh, is a standard Wilson line V naught. Uh, for instance, in this first term, this is just an unpolarized Wilson line for a minus moving um, quark. The anti quark is polarized, um, so we need to write the non iconal correction to this Wilson line to write down an operator uh, which we call. Uh, say, V1 polarized here or V1 polarized there. there. Um, and uh, uh, Z, as I said, is the longitudinal momentum fraction, right? So we have some longitudinal momentum spread between the anti quark and quark. So the polarized line carries the uh, fraction Z. So it's anti quark line here or the quark line there. Um, um, it's actually a little more subtle than that, but uh, 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 let's say so this is a fraction Z. So we have this operator, which is a function of Z. Double angle brackets means that we scaled out energy dependence. So usual target averaging in CGC is single angle brackets for multiplied by ZS uh, because we know this object is sub icons energy suppressed, so suppressed. So we want to remove this suppression by multiplying this by ZS and get this double. Okay. You change conversion because it was a, a, a minus zero gauge before. Oh, yes. Uh, yes. Well, yeah, when I write something like this, yes. <laughs> um, oh, wow. Oh, wow. Well. Uh, <laughs> I think, uh, I think I'll, I'll switch, I'll switch them back so, so they keep going. So I'm always in a light gun gauge, not of the protein, but of the projectile, or whatever the projectile is. <laughs> By the way, Cyril, do we have a, a chairman who tell me to stop at some point? Stop. So, <laughs> <why it's laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, I started like 10 minutes later. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so, so this, is, this is the operator, and it just comes out from, I mean, this is when we are massage this diagram B to get this expression, we get this object. Or from the CDS cross section that we know this. Um, okay, um, so now we need to write an operator for the polarized Wilson line. How we do it? This is a more recent one. These results we, we've got for, for, for some years. Um, so if you really want to do it operatorially, we say, okay, well, we have to say a quark propagating through the background U and field, and we want uh, a sub iconal correction to it, which knows about spin. So one of the given exchanges would depend, would be non iconal uh, and it would transfer the spin information between the target and the projectile. Um, uh, only one, because we really look at the leading sub iconal uh, order. Um, uh, a, all other blue ones are just Wilson lines. So we'll have a Wilson line, sub icon interaction, Wilson line. Or if you want to, uh, so at the same order, you have to include T channel exchanges of quarks. So you need these diagrams uh, where you exchange a quark down this way and then you regain the quark from the target. So you have two different positions. So you have two sub iconal insertions. And this is the same order as one sub icon blue. So you have a Wilson line, say quark Wilson line, then some sort of a sub iconal operator insertion. Then you continue on as a blue and Wilson line, another sub icon insertion, and then back to the quark Wilson line. Sure, there are two rules in sub icon level. They don't carry spin to it or plus i and plus i, for example. Uh, right, so, so the dominant sub icon contribution is like shown on the blackboard here. One of them is sub iconal, one of them is icon. I cannot aim so precisely. <laughs> So one new one has to be sub iconal, the other one is icon. Can you write down F with indices? I think. Uh, yeah, you're talking about epsilon ij, f plus i, f yes, plus j. Yes, and then you, uh, okay, that will come for the gluon distribution. And you again expand it. You write this as d plus a i um, minus d i a plus minus i g a plus a i. And you say, okay, I know, because I did the calculation, that so A plus field is the iconal one. A perp field is the spin-dependent spin dependent sub-iconal field. I don't know if you guys can see what I'm writing. 
Um, and so you, you expand, right? So you want to stay at the uh, linear order in AI. That's the leading order contribution. The, the leading iconal piece is just A plus, A plus, with epsilon ij that gives zero. So you take the right and the right in the formulation where I think it's convenient for you. This is not gauge. Not gauge. No, no, that's not gauge. Um, yeah, because I'm working on a particular gauge. Yes, yeah. sorry, that's right. Working on a particular gauge, I know that A plus is my leading iconal field over plus moving proton, say, in the light con gauge of the projectile. A perp is a sub iconal field. So, so the answer to your question. B plus in that one is B i. Right, so. Uh, both, uh, both, uh, both with the same, uh, the same, uh, uh, the same, uh, Contribution that leading both of them. No, no. Yes, because one comes with di. No, di, di just di uh, doesn't introduce energy suppression. Exactly. You want plus one. does. T plus. D plus does. So right. So so this is sub iconal. So if I remember correctly, no. the leading what? Okay, no? well, let's yeah. All right. So so the leading part. So you keep you keep this contribution in one of them and this one in another one. So that's what it means that you have. That's why you with the the leading sub spin-dependent correction is with one gluon being sub spin-dependent, another one being a good old icon. Even Bartels had this. Oh, no. can you I, I think you can rewrite in a gauge non invariant way, but why, what's the purpose of it? Because then I can go with the same gauge. And uh, I'll <coughs> say, take a yeah. But I mean, so. I will start with gas latent variant the operator and calculate Well, we all have our own techniques, right? I think we're arguing about the method rather You're supposed to waste your time, John. DI and Okay, I think this D plus AI and DI A plus are both equivalent. Not one is subleading the other. No, because D plus also. Okay, so you so you do the you do, you do. You do the standard Fields calculation. Are nice coordinates, and coordinates are coordinates. So then, when you make a boost, D plus A I and D I A plus, they both scale equally. Yes. So they are both iconal, or they not not iconal, but they are equally. Uh, so you yes. just know they transform. You're saying in the same way. They transform in the same. Uh, yeah. When you make a boost, so 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 Giovanni, sorry. Uh, if say if you take a plus moving proton and you you're looking at its leading uh, gluon field um, with a gamma plus here uh, in um, a minus, for instance, equals zero gauge, um, you get an a plus field. Uh, if you, and, but this is completely spin independent, and this is say order one in the counting of a large P plus momentum. If you want to go and find a spin dependence, so you say that your quark here uh, has some spin and you want the spin dependent correction to this leading A plus order field, uh, you insert the gamma perp here uh, and the end result will be, uh, if I remember it right, the transverse field and it will be of the order of one over P plus. So agree. it will be suppressed. I agree. A plus is not a, a I is suppressed with respect to A plus. But D plus A I and D I A plus are not each one suppressed. You should not take the field separately. I don't see how taking a derivative of this object is going to make so it. Uh, becomes yeah, just for the three space. So, then, so yeah, but that's not the yeah. um, This is derivative of the gluon field. That's not uh, the light moment. The light moment will be the core yeah. screen through. Yeah. The light moment becomes a sub icon because you have an integration of the dx minus. Uh, sure. so, uh, no, I understand what you're saying. So, yeah, both I, uh, I don't, uh, I think I checked, and that's not the case. I don't remember. In the formalism, this two operator comes with an extra integration of the x minus, which makes that operator sub icon with respect to the icon. Uh, uh, no, uh, no. Yes? No. Maybe for the spin purposes, you can throw away the control. Now, look, for, for unpolarized physics, for an in model, people keep only a plus and a perp with energy suppressed. So yes, a plus and a perp 
fine. But when you take the combination, when you calculate F plus meaning, you have, but even when you, in the whole class, you compute F plus I, you compute in this way, so it should right. be a reason, right? Yes, so when, you can, how can you calculate F plus otherwise I, you're all wrong. don't keep the A pure. <laughs> otherwise, yeah, yeah. otherwise, like half the students will be who have written most of their own papers and will also have to retire. You keep saying the A and there are the least derivatives. Let's say, discuss it later. I don't remember. I hear what you're saying. I, something is not right here. I don't remember. F plus I is what. different than simply I. Giovanni, you're risking your status as a convener. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's discuss it in the afternoon now. What? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you want to do the work? You're really risking that. OK, anyway. Um, We'll, we'll, we'll okay. take it okay. offline, maybe we'll discuss it in the afternoon. Yeah. Okay, uh, so uh, we do the calculation. It's not easy, but we do it. Um, uh, well, it's kind of straightforward if you know what you're doing. So uh, this, is the, uh, this is the answer for the, for the first contribution. You have two Wilson lines with the sub icon correction, uh, uh, which can be written as F12 field strength. Uh, so the F12 component of the field strength tensor. Um, uh, and the sub icon, you have this explicit one over S suppression. And the second term, of course, is two <coughs> integrals over two X minus positions of two sub iconal insertions. One is psi, one is psi bar. And not surprisingly, for helicity, we have this one half gamma plus gamma five operator emerging from the calculation that is inserted there. Otherwise, we have a fundamental Wilson line. Uh, then we have an adjoint Wilson line. And then another fundamental. Really, but what is the guy which you don't like both? Where's the plus I I is both? If this order it doesn't happen, this is a definition of a new one. Well, you say the sub sub icon or what? This was up, so I have to write it. So when I start talking about blue and felicity TNT, it's probably not going to happen today. But in the uh, book. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, uh, but for blue one distribution, yes, you have F, F plus I, F plus J uh -huh. with epsilon I, J. So if you're asking about new one, that's the operator to work with. Uh, uh, in terms of, uh, so this is a bit of a subtle thing, um, which is uh, maybe not terribly important, but um, if you, you know how like um, you have a dipole blue one distribution, you have Weizsäcker Williams blue one distribution, and yeah. unpolarized things, right? And the dipole one is called the dipole because it's related to the scattering amplitude of a four hands of that dipole. But you can also just define it as a TNT for the correlator and the Wilson mean. Uh, so it turns out that if for helicity distribution, if you take a V1 distribution, which is a dipole one, it is not related to scattering a quark of V1 dipole on the target in the spin okay. Those are different operators. And uh, it just it is what it is. But, uh, so the, the acronym dipole kind of. Not quite right. Technically, it means that that operator just it doesn't come to you the expansion of the quark in the external field. Yeah. Right. Right. So, so this is just a quark propagator in the external field. I understand. Is it right? There is no such operator. So, you have a paper? Yes. Well, then, okay, let's pass forward. Uh, anyway. This, as you young yourself noticed a year or two ago, this is F12, which is the Z component of the magnetic field, right? So this is mu dot B. So this has a, this has a very clear physical meaning. If I have a longitude, so this is the Z direction. If I have a quark with a magnetic moment mu, which is in the Z direction, we're looking at mu dot B type of interaction, mu would couple to BZ, which is F1. So it couldn't be too long. Um, okay, anyway. Uh, we have to repeat the exercise for the blue ones. We have again a non icon insertion which gives us F12 now in the, um, in the joint representation wrapped around a joint Wilson lines, plus a contribution with quark exchanges and then a joint uh, uh, and then a Wilson line followed by a fundamental Wilson line and again by a joint Wilson line. So use for me are joint Wilson lines, these are fundamental. Um, okay. Um, so, um, and then one can write down evolution equations for these operators. Uh, but before we do it, well, it's easier to end up writing everything in, is just in, uh, right away in the large and C limit. And then I'll show you the results in the large and C and F limit. And in the paper, we have the more formal 
um, you know, kind of like Balinski hierarchy, evolution equations for the type was made up of this depolarized and depolarized. So, um, taking a large NC limit, you can make a dipole out of gluons, you can make a dipole out of quarks. So, GI joint is a gluon dipole, G uh, is a fundamental dipole, and it turns out that the large NC limit, the relation between the uh, N1 2 means the same transfer size. The difference, uh, so, so there's a factor of four here, which is different from a factor of two, one is uh, used to seeing a non polar. Case with a square, not power, not the one. No, linear case. Ah, I saw. So it's like an S matrix. Yeah, when you expand it also. Sorry, you're right. Uh, um, when you expand the S matrix, the S matrix factorizing and the T matrix is a uh, linear. Um, right, so, so sorry. So it's, it's like, right, so in an unpolarized case, we just say something like S1, yes. S1 0. A joint is S10, S10, but then if you write it as 1 minus N10, a joint is 1 minus 2N10 plus N10 squared, and you linearize it, right? Then you get, sorry, so then it's N10, a joint equals 2N10. So this is what we're trying to do. Everything here is like, most of the time it's linearized because we're we can throw away the saturation corrections. We're not really after saturation, but we can put it back, back in two. But most of the discussion is linearized, so we put the service things like that and, uh, and such. So equations are linear. Okay, so how do we write the evolution equations? We write them in the same way as an unpolarized case. So this, say, this is a case of an adjoint dipole. Again, the box means a spin dependent subarchial interaction. You can have gluon exchanges in various ways. Where the blow means again a subicon interaction. So, for instance, you can emit a blue one, which, uh, through, because of the subiconal uh, spin dependent part of the vertex, the emitted new blue one would carry the spin information, which previously was carried by the incoming blue one. And then this new blue one would interact with the shockwave in a spin dependent way, but on the other end, it interacts with the spin independent way. And the same thing, uh, you can have a mirror image of that guy. Then the no, uh, spin independent non iconal vertex can also happen up here. Um, uh, you have these diagrams, and then actually you have all the standard iconal diagrams, where both vertices are iconal, and this, uh, the new one just carries its spin uh, onward uh, by emitting a soft, huge, unpolarized new one. So in all, in the standard way, like in the, in the standard small x uh, dipole evolution. Uh, so uh, um, maybe it's a good point not to show evolution equations, but first to say something about the resummation parameter. You so yes, uh, tell you again what I want. Yes, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap up here. I'm not gonna talk about all the other things. Yeah, I to be the break. Yes, we need to. Yes. Right. So so just to stress and uh, say BFKL, um, Jimbal, BK. Well, we have leading log resummation. Here, the leading resummation parameter is a double log. So alpha s log squared one over this. This is what we're resumming. And the second log comes from the integration of the transverse momentum. So we need the part of the transverse integration space, um, uh, which actually it has a UV divergence, which in this Felicit case doesn't cancel and it's cut off by the center of mass energy, not by, uh, not, uh, in an unpolarized case, there are no UV divergences. They cancel and the transverse integral doesn't generate a local energy. And this is not new, it's been known for many years, starting by papers, papers by Kirchner, and Lipatov in the early 80s, um, and, and others here as well. Uh, so, uh, this is sort of, um, uh, this is an example of the equations we get. These are the evolution equations in the large NC limit for the amplitude G. The equation for G itself doesn't close. You need to introduce an auxiliary amplitude gamma, which we refer to as a neighbor type amplitude, but for, for which you write a separate evolution equation. I don't have the time to um, explain it in more detail. We can take it offline with interested parties. The initial conditions can be taken at Born level. Um, uh, saturation effects also may be included here by multiplying it by unpolarized S matrices on the, on the other side. So you, one has a saturation version of this equation too. And the saturation really effect, the physical effect, the saturation corrections just kill the evolution, kill all the right hand side. So the good thing is we know that when saturation kicks in, there's probably not much speed left there. Uh, again, we can discuss it in more detail. Um, uh, the, these equations, the large C equations we first solve, uh, this is a log of this amplitude G as a function of 
eta is sort of like rapidity log of energy, and S10 is log of the transverse direction. Uh, we've got this numerical solution. We saw, my God, it looks like just a flat plane, so we really have a scaling. Instead of the solution being a uh, function of two variables, it's a function of one variable, which is the difference between them. Um, and we can solve these equations analytically. Um, um, yeah, okay, I, I didn't have a slide for that, but we can solve the equations analytically and get this result, this power alpha h, is analytically given here, which agreed with a numerical result where we got this 2.31. Uh, um, again, because the resummation parameter is alpha log squared, 1 over x, this uh, power is uh, proportional to square root of one over x. Okay, uh, as I promised there, uh, in the beginning, uh, just a few words, one can also take the legend C and an F limit where quark loops would survive, and F is a number of flavors. So you also have this two new diagrams in the evolution <coughs> say, of a given dipole where you emit this quark, soft quark, which carries the information about uh, uh, polarization. Uh, and uh, you, you have to write a separate equation for that uh, fundamental dipole. And then the equations get somewhat more complicated, uh, but nonetheless, it's the closest to locations which one can solve. Okay, so uh, I don't have the time to talk about helicity and transversity, but we already saw my like, summary, so let me just jump to conclusions. Uh, uh, so the story with uh, helicity, it was gluon helicity and transversity is the same story. You take the operator, massage it, uh, get, the, um, get the answer, and uh, uh, get, get the simplified form, which you can evolve, write down small x evolution equations, solve them, and you get the power. So of course, you know, it sounds easier, but each step is a lot of work. Uh, so these are the results you've seen in the beginning. So the quark one I explained in detail, the new one, uh, helicity you can derive uh, by a uh, similar method, and transversity you can derive as well. And there is a lot of future work in this direction one can do. Pretty much everything we do in an unpolarized small x evolution case, you can do for this helicity one, right? You can talk about running coupling corrections, you can talk about NLO corrections, which is here leading log corrections, not double log, but even single log corrections. Those have not, not been calculated yet in either uh, in any of the frameworks. You can solve those complicated legacy and an F equations. You can look at orbital angular momentum, as I mentioned, the small x, um, to, to try to constrain um, the, 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 the speed sum of the small x. Um, and of course, relation to EIC is. Uh, the EAC would give us an insight on all those TMDs and PDFs uh, with, a, with a hopefully high precision to, down to a reasonably small x. So we hope that the combination of EAC data and the theory of it here would actually be able to help us constrain the small x behavior of helicity TMDs and uh, at least rule out or exhaust that end of the phase space in, in our pursuit of, uh, of, of uh, resolving the spin pulse. Thank you very much. You the chair, you should say something. Any question? <laughs> <laughs> I have a quick question. Page 23. One is three. Oh, I have page number. Amazing. Not everywhere. No, it's only 20. Yeah, yeah. So, since uh, we know that uh, this alpha s log square of 1 over x cannot be obtained when we use big and approach as we told uh, to the unfeasible point. So, I don't think it's a good idea to start from uh, operator which has been derived uh, in TMD and then massage them <coughs> back to small x. We should start from small x because in this way you Miss some operator. You should start from the small x techniques, derive the work propagator with all the subatomic interaction, take your observable, calculate uh, the cross section, uh, observe what are the relevant operator, and then calculate the evolution of those operators. This would be the more natural small x way of thinking. Right, so this is how so you are doing that work. You are thinking no, no, no. about no, no, yes, no, When you can see the visualization, you do have these changes. One small directions which nobody is interested in. You do that. You take the production of, I don't know, deep bottom or whatever. You may miss some operators. And you did no, 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 they're not some operators, but in the operators. And that is they are written in Charles Gordon's article. So, just for the record, Giovanni, we started by looking at.
at cities. Even at small labs, they do have them. And in that this way. Why are you listen to my talk on this problem? Okay, let, let me just make a comment. So, Giovanni, one second. Can I have some? Uh, so we started with uh, CDS process, small X, small X process. And uh, that depends, uh, the answer here also depends on the same dipole amplitude, this polarized dipole amplitude and the rot evolution. Curve. So we started not with operators, but really in the standard small X. Curve. So, you know, we're all the righteous small X people here. Uh, but uh, but, but in, the end of the day, in the end of the day, if, you, if your goal is to verify, say, the stuff in my heart, the spin decomposition, um, or G if you wish, uh, but this is just a monitor. So if you want to calculate those things, how do you relate the CDS observable to those things? Um, that, that's a bit of a question. You can just say, okay, this CDS cross-section, you can just rewrite it as something times the TMD, and then you get the TMD and integrate it over the T and you get the Oh, his, answer was, his question was correct, that uh, if you consider low X from the beginning, yes, some process like CDs. Yes. Nobody knew that it will be PMD factorization of small X, why, you know? I mean, it was not known, we just... Uh, right, but ultimately, I want a PDF. Yeah, the, yeah this I don't even yes, care about factorization, yes, yes, right? If you are about cross-section, CD is a uh, production of the particle, yes? And you want to write down PMD. Uh, I may ask you why, because John Collins and other people wrote it exactly at the end of one. If you ask John Collins about words, he will tell you I know nothing, actually, about it for somebody else. Okay, so, so why, where did uh, this factorization, where the formula number one comes from? And this is a valid question, but I think it comes if you look. Uh, right, I mean, for me, the formula number one, which I presume is this formula, is uh, I just take the lowest order side bar side correlator with gamma five uh, gamma plus, which, which is which which measures helicity. Oh, yeah, that comes after. after I'm what? talking about no, it doesn't come after. Let's not assume any factorization. Right. I just want to know what the operator counts the number of um, counts the helicity of the coil. No, I don't even want to cross section. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 It's like BK, or you know, BK, I'm sorry. BK, you can uh, double BK, BK or not. You can in two ways or not. Yes, but BK is a, is a, is a, uh, was designed, at least uh, on my end of things, to calculate cross-sections and have two structure functions, diplomacy, scattering, cross-sections. We can do that, but in puzzle, I don't know how to write this in terms of cross-sections. No, no, I know I, I it's in puzzle in terms of PDFs, I, 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 so I have to connect the PDFs. So what, what this can be derived without any factorization assumptions in the sense that you just say, okay, I have some, you know, A dagger A operator for, for my quarks, which depends on helicity. I multiply it by helicity and sum it and sandwich in my proton state, right? This is, you don't have to know any factorization to write something like this. Yeah, this is a helicity measure. What? So, right. So you, you write it in terms of side by side, you don't know which will some lines to take, but ultimately it doesn't matter for me because I would integrate over OKT and I'm gonna measure PDF. I'm just taking this particular see this Wilson lines here because it's convenient and I know how to work with it. Uh, in terms of gluon, uh, when I talk about gluon helicity, for instance, ah, one direction. For gluon helicity, we talk about um, uh, actually uh, dipole distribution. So the uh, right, so for the gluon helicity, we take Wilson lines like this. Again, it doesn't matter because we, uh, we integrate over all KT in the end to get the PT. For transversity, we take the CDS link. Uh, ultimately, you, do, you also do to get the tensor charge, you integrate over all KT. Okay, Sorry. maybe we should stop. Yeah, maybe we should stop, Giovanni. Uh, uh, we, can, we can continue in the afternoon, maybe, if, if there are more questions. Yeah, we have this informal. Yes, if we, if we, yes, okay. What does a crowd feel? Do we, uh, El, do you need a few minutes to get set up, or? Uh? We need, need to set up anyway. So that's going to be a break. Okay, so let's make a... Uh, oh, let's make a break now, coffee break now. So let's... Um, Two hours and ten minutes. Yeah. So hold on. Eleven thirty. Ten thirty. Oh. Okay. So let's make a.